Good morning. <clears throat> well, some of you have noticed the uh, picture up here. That's Nathan's picture. He bought that. I actually bought it at Brittany's Brothers Church, which is in Liberty, right? What's the name of the church? Okay. So anyway, I thought that's such a cool, a cool picture, which reminded me about. Let me say I turn to it. Uh, Revelations, probably one. Uh, yeah, uh, Revelation chapter one, verse seventeen says, "When I saw him, talking about Jesus, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead.'" And behold, I am alive forever and ever, and hold the keys of death and Hades. Amen. So, yeah, we got those keys. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. All right. So, use your imagination, and by faith, appears a nice graphic that Becky did that says Romans chapter 3, because that's where, where we are at. And I'm going to be touching on several different things this morning, but before I actually get to, uh, uh, get to Romans, uh, I want to kind of again set the stage because Paul wrote to the Romans, uh, it was 57 AD, okay? And I'm going to actually start in Galatians because I want to look at an issue that he's been dealing with for almost 10 years now through his ministry. And that is uh, the fact of, think about that for a while, that, that the, uh, the Jewish believers, of course, Jewish believers were the first ones to get saved, right? Because from the day of Pentecost, spirit fell, and then they were all there in Jerusalem. They went back to their hometowns where they were living, some in Rome, and they, they brought the gospel back with them. But their understanding of the gospel, they knew that Jesus was Messiah, but what the problem was that as they interacted with Gentiles and as Gentiles began to come into church and began to actually outnumber the Jewish believers, then uh, problems began to arise because the Jewish believers, not all of them, but there were some we call the Judaizers who were saying, okay, it's great that you've received Yeshua, Jesus as your Savior, but you must follow the Torah, you must follow the, the commandments of the law, you must follow dietary laws, celebrate the feast, all, all those things. And so Paul, you know, he, he's constantly warring about that. And that's the main uh, topic in Galatians, and it continues on through his ministry. So I want to start in Galatians chapter 1. Now this isn't about that part of it, this is about Paul's insight. Because we talked about how Paul, his conversion, talked about a, a dynamic conversion where he was literally going to persecute Christians in Damascus and has that experience, right? Bright light, voice from heaven, he's blinded. And it's interesting that what uh, the Lord tells Ananias, the guy who comes to lay hands on him to open his eyes so he could see, was that well, you're going to have a great TV ministry. You're going to uh, have a, a bunch of satellite churches. And now he said, I'm going to show him how much he must suffer for the gospel. And it's kind of like, I don't know if I want to sign up for that, you know. But that's more, you want to be an apostle? Okay, go for it. But in Galatians chapter 1, I want to give some more of his insight because it wasn't just his conversion that was so critical. So in chapter 1, verse 11, he says, I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel that I preach is not something that man made up. I did not receive it from man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. So in other words, Jesus preaching Jesus can't get any better than that. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God 
and I tried to destroy it. Now, I was advancing in Judaism beyond many Jews of my own age, and I was extremely jealous, zealous for the traditions of my father. So he was, he was on his way to becoming a star in Judaism. I mean, usually they have the, the Torah memorized, okay? But when God, who set me apart from birth and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not consult man, nor did I go to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was. But I went in immediately into Arabia and later returned to Damascus. So he goes into Arabia, and for he's there for a, a three-year period, and he's getting a download, getting revelations of what the gospel is. And what better person to have than someone who was so steeped in Judaism and was advancing to the hierarchy in the faith. And so this was, again, he's writing to the, to the Galatians about 48 A.D. And then by the time he get into the church and writing the letter to Romans, it's in 57. So almost, almost a decade of time between when he's starting with Galatians, and he's still dealing with these same issues. Now, you don't need to turn there, but 2 Corinthians 3, 6 is a familiar verse which says that Paul says, I'm a minister of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now, a couple other scriptures before we get to... Uh, Romans, Colossians, it's right before all your T's, Colossians uh, chapter 1, and verse 25 through 27, <clears throat> and Paul says, I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of his mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So he's saying there was a mystery that was hidden but now is being revealed. And that is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And in chapter 2 of Colossians, verses 13 through 17, and he says, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us of all our sins, having counseled the written code with its regulation that was against us, that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross." So while the Jews were expecting a Messiah, they were not expecting a Messiah, a suffering servant that would take the sins of the world upon himself. And so, again, this is a revelation. So Paul is warring against centuries of Jewish understanding and tradition. Okay, so now let's turn over to Romans Because this is going to bring up, actually, some other issues. And I'm actually going to start in the last two couple verses of uh, chapter 2.
in verse 28, he says, A man is not a Jew if he is only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the Spirit, not by the written code. Such a man's praise is not from men, but from God. So this brings up an issue because, again, in the Jewish mind, they were the chosen people. And so if you want to take this, because we're going to get later as you get into Romans, you get into the issue of election and being chosen. What does that mean? Well, that depends what side of the conundrum you're on, because we have on one side of the, the body of Christ, you have those we either call Reformed or Calvinist uh, who believe that you are predestined, okay? So in this case, Cindy here was predestined. Jesse, sorry, he's out. He's actually condemned, okay? And you may think, well, that sounds a little strange, but you know, I can argue both positions. There's a lot of Scripture on both sides. Great men of God who would stand with that and believe that, okay? And I always thought about going through the Bible, having two different, two different color markers, you know, and every verse that seemed to indicate that, all about election, about being chosen, marked in one color, and those that went with, with a free choice, underlining a different color, and then kind of compare. But what really kind of helped me more than anything was the view that, okay, in the Old Testament, the Jews were the chosen people. Most of them, uh, actually apostatized and went and worshiped other gods, and God had to bring judgment. So when you think about being chosen or being elected, how were they chosen or elected? Well, I want to look at, again, just Deuteronomy 32. I want to read that. I've read that before. Uh, verses 8 and 9 says, When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided all mankind... He set up boundaries for the people, and according to the number of the sons of God, for the Lord's portion is his people Jacob, who, whose name was changed to Israel, right? His allotted inheritance. And also in chapter 7, we find another uh, 7 verses 6 and 8. It says, for, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God, talking about Israel. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. And the Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other people, for you were the fewest of all people. And then goes on and talks about because of the oath he gave to Abraham. So you have a chosen people set apart to actually be the light to the nations, which they failed to do. Okay? So as we think about election, we think, okay, what were they given? And that is why, as you come to verse 1, of chapter 3, it ties in to those other couple verses we just read in into chapter 2. Because then the question would be, well, then what advantages is there to being a Jew? Or what value is there in circumstances? So that'd be the natural question. Okay, if we are the chosen people, if we are the elect, then, and now you're saying it's only if 
what's in your heart it has nothing to do with ethnicity or it doesn't have anything to do with being chosen or elected. But then he says, much in every way. First of all, they have been entrusted with the very words of God. So in other words, they were entrusted with two-thirds of this, what we call the Old Testament. Now, what they did with it, that's an individual thing. So in other words, they were elected, they were chosen, but not individually. They were given the Word of God. They were given the advantages of it, but they failed in their walking it out. And he goes on in verse 3, and he says, Now what if some of them did not have faith? Well, it's kind of an understatement because most of them did not have faith. Most of them had turned, and it was only a remnant that were faithful. And it says, With their lack of faith nullifies God's fullness. Not at all. God be true, and every man a liar as it is written, so that you may prove right when you speak and prevail when you judge. Now, Paul does some interesting thing there. He's quoting the Old Testament uh, in verse 4, and he takes one verse out of Psalms. If you look in your margins, you should see Psalms 116, verse 11, and the second part is from taken from Psalms 51, verse 4. So we could argue and say, well, Paul, you're taking those out of context. And he does the same thing down below. He's a long stretch where he does that. But he actually knows the Word of God. So he's able to take this one from here, this one here, to make, make a point. And then he goes on and says, but if our righteousness, and what he's doing a lot through this, he's, he's making a statement he knows it's going to invoke a question in your mind, okay? Because he says, but if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust in bringing his wrath on us. I am using human arguments. Certainly not. If that was so... How could, judge, how could God judge the world? Someone might argue if my falsehood, or we could say if my sin, enhanced God's truthfulness and so increases his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? Why not say, as we are being slanderously reported as saying, and as some claim that we say, let us do evil that good may result. Their condemnation is deserved. So this was a issue, another issue that the people would twist Paul's teaching on grace to say, hey, you're all under grace. Whatever you do, your sins are forgiven. Doesn't matter how you live. Live as you want. And he's saying, no, that's not what I'm saying. And that's why later in the New Testament, we even have some saying, well, people misunderstand or misuse Paul's words. And so he's being clear, no, that is not what I'm saying. It is, but if you really preach grace correctly, it should bring that question to your mind. It's almost like it's almost too good to be true, you know? And so that would be a question that would come up, and you can see how that could easily be misused and was. And so they would accuse Paul of sloppy grace, of, of sloppy agape, you know, the, hey, just live your life. And it, no, that is not what I am saying, but how wonderful grace is. So he goes on and says, what shall we conclude then? Are we any better? We have already made a charge that Jews and Gentiles 
alike are all under sin. So basically, we're all in a heap of trouble. If it's based on us, if it's based on our performance, based on our past, based on our life, we're in a heap of trouble. And then he goes below and and gives several different references from uh, from the Psalms, from Ecclesiastes. He just picks different ones all the way through. It says, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away and have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. There are Throats are an open grave, their tongues practice deceit. The poisons of viper is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin the misery marks their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Okay, verse 19, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law or the Torah, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of, of sin. So what was the purpose of the law? To make us conscious of sin, to know that we are guilty. And by his standards, we are all guilty. Okay, verse 21. But now there's a righteousness from God apart from the law or apart from the Torah has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference. Okay, again, going back, there's no difference whether you're a Jew or whether you're a Gentile. We're all in trouble. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace. So all of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short. But praise God for the grace that has been given us. And it's through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Okay? God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. So he did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. So what he's saying is, God is love, God is grace, but God is also just. Okay? In other words, justice has to be served. It's the old, you do the crime, you do the time. All right? So all of us were guilty. None of us can boast. None of us can come and say, well, I deserve it because I think my good, you know, my good side outweighs the bad things I've done. He said, no, you are all guilty. And because of God's justice, his justice has, has to be fulfilled. He can't just forget it. And so... By the blood of Jesus, by Jesus taking on 
your sin and my sin. And we think about the cross and we think about how horrible it was. But the most horrible part was that he took my sin and your sin and he became sin. And where even the father had to turn and look and he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he was carrying the sins of all of us on himself. And so God's justice had to be fulfilled. Your sins and my sins had to be fulfilled. It had to be paid for. And it was paid by the precious blood of Jesus. What an awesome, glorious thing. And again, I don't think any of us, as we go on and read, it says, where then is the boasting? I don't think there's none of us who can boast in our own righteousness. It is excluded. On what principle? On that of observing the law. You know, there's one place where Paul even says, you know, I, I'm faultless as far as the law. As far as, you know, the big, the big commandments. But he also says, we have all sinned and all have fallen short. No, but on that of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. Now, that's still an issue, remember, because you've got a mixed church. You've got a mixed church of Jews and Gentiles, and you've got the Jews who have been century steeped in how you fulfill the law. And he says, is the God of the Jews only? If he is not the God of Gentiles too, yes, of the Gentiles too. Since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through the same faith. Do we then nullify the law? The law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. In other words, we will hold the, the moral laws that were taught in the Old Testament. We hold them up. We say, yes, they're there for a reason. That's how we are to live. And so we have this, this issue of Yes, we are saved by grace, and it's only by grace because there's no way we could save ourselves. It's only by the blood of Jesus. And that, that precious, and it and not only saved us from our sins in the past, but also the, even the sins because we're going to fall short even in the future. But that's where you get that little twist where people can say, well, I'm forgiven now, forgiven the past, I'm forgiven the future. I think I'll just do what I want to do. And again, Paul is saying, no, that is not. There should be a gratefulness that comes out from your spirit because you realize, my gosh, what I deserve. We don't want what we deserve. We want mercy because what we all deserve is hell. But it's only by the mercy and the grace of Jesus Christ that we come before him. And in our case, as we talk about that, about being chosen, about being uh, elected, we look at the examples from the nation of Israel. They were set apart. They were chosen. Okay, you guys, this is, you have the word of God. You've been given all the ordinances. But most of them did not carry through with it. Most of them turned into apost apostasy, actually, worshiping other gods. So when we are elected, when we hear the word of God, when we have this available to us, then it's, it's upon us. It's on our responsibility what we do with it. And, you know, even within some what we call kind of hyper-Calvinistic groups, they will not even give an invitation because that person might get false assurance that they're not really saved. And if you're really saved, you're saved, and so it doesn't really matter. So 
And again, I don't want to throw stones because there's a lot of scriptures that they can come up with. I've read books on both sides, and you know, each of them have a lot of scriptures. But I think individually we come down to it's your personal, you've got to make that decision. It's on each of us. And so as he's outlining, as he goes through Romans, he's outlining so many different things. You know, the problem, again, with the, between the Jews and the Gentiles and the issues that were going on that caused division within the church and caused, caused frictions. You know, he, he's constantly kind of dealing with that. And he, he begins to set aside, again, how we are saved by grace, standing firm that it's only by his grace that we stand. And so, again, but because of that grace, then it sh- should change our life. Because a lot of times on the other side, we will say, well, all you got to do is believe. Well, if you really believe... Wouldn't it change your life? Wouldn't your belief change the direction, you know, of where you're going? I mean, I believe George Washington was the first president of the United States. I think he was a great man. But it doesn't change my life. Why belief in the Son of God changes my life. It changes how I live. It changes my priorities. It changes everything. Because, you know, what is it? James who says, uh, you know, even the demons believe. So, belief, there has to be something that follows belief. It has to be a turning the direction of your life. If you really believe, if you really receive that grace, then you're going to go a different way. You're going to walk, you're going to live a different way than you did in the past. And I think for most of us, we can all say we've been in that place. You know, I was, I was running fast after partying. I was a party guy. I was a fraternity, you know. And then when that time comes and all of a sudden the Lord grabs a hold of you, then you change and you're, you're walking a whole different direction. You're realizing the forgiveness you've had and you're realizing, that, hey, I love you, Lord. You love me. And because of that love, because of that grace, I want to be pleasing to you. I want to live my life. Yeah, it's not going to be perfect. I'm going to fall, stumble, but I'm going to get back up and I'm going to continue to run after you hard because you are worthy of all that you have done for us, for me, for you. He is worthy of all our praise. He's worthy of all our worship. He is worthy of our life changing and walking a different way. Plus, there's many benefits. You know, my favorite verse, Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. All these things that the, he uses the word Gentile, but it's unbelievers want. You know, riches, happiness, joy, you know, whatever it is, all these things will be given to you as you begin to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And then you find some of those desires you used to have and things you wanted to do, you really don't even want to do anymore. He begins to change your desires and to bring them in line with with his will and his word. So there's a lot in chapter 3. There's a lot throughout the book of Romans. And so as we're going to work through that next week, uh, Nathan will be doing chapter 4. And like I say, there's so much in it. So I encourage you guys to read through the book of Romans, just kind of preparing yourself, getting it downloaded, thinking with questions, uh, because there's so much, there's so much doctrine that's in it. So Lord, we just thank you for your word. Lord, that your word is deep, and, and Lord, we thank you for the grace that wonderful thing called grace, unmerited favor that you have given us, that you have called us out of darkness and you've called us into the light. And Lord, I'm thankful that you have not given us what we deserve, 
But, Lord, you have given us grace and mercy. Lord, though all sins be as scarlet, Lord, they have been made white as snow. That you have removed our sins as far as the east is to the west. So, Lord, I ask that you would help us to walk worthily of that calling. Worthy of that election, Lord, that you have made us part of the kingdom of God. So, Lord, we thank you for the shed blood of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that you have taken not only our sins, but, Lord, our shame. And, Lord, you have brought us into a place of joy and a place of freedom. Lord, that you have freed us from the enemy. And Lord, we just say we love you. We praise you. Lord, we give you our lives afresh and anew. Just reminding ourselves of what has been done on our behalf. How you have set us free. How you have redeemed us. How you have become our propitiation of our sins and brought us into the kingdom of light, and that we have eternity to spend with you. So, Lord, I, I just, just with a grateful heart, we say thank you, Lord. We praise you. If anyone would like prayer, whether it's for healing, or if you never made that decision, to publicly receive the Lord Jesus is your Lord and Savior. Come up. Let this be the day. Today is the day of salvation. And whatever else you might need prayer for, we'll have a song. And feel free to come up and we'll pray for you.